this is Tommy Franks. Welcome to the Four Star Leadership Podcast, a product of the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute and Museum. We're here to get a view into the lives of the legacy makers, the movers, and the shakers of today to offer insights from the full spectrum of the leadership community. We'll talk to former four-star students and explore their leadership development path. We'll work to find out what they are about today and learn from the opportunities they've made for themselves in this world. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this podcast. Remember, leaders are not born, they're developed. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Core Principles of Leadership with General Tommy Franks. I am your host, Delise Travis, and we are on episode number 15 with our special guest, T.W. Shannon, and we'll be talking about championing common sense solutions for community issues. But before we start our program, we'll hear a word from our major sponsor, REI Oklahoma. REI Oklahoma is proud to be a part of the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute in the production and distribution of these podcasts designed to inspire leaders and difference makers. At REI Oklahoma, we have been working with small business leaders, entrepreneurs, and people who are driven to succeed for years. Highly motivated people working to own their own businesses, live in their own homes, and make the world a better place. Since its beginning, REI Oklahoma has continued to identify hurdles and deliver holistic solutions to create job growth and help neighborhoods thrive in both rural and urban communities. REI Oklahoma looks forward to visiting with you about helping your business and community grow. Visit reiok.org or call 800-658-2823 to start the conversation. We'd like to offer a special thank you to the Labar family for their support of the Core Principles of Leadership with General Tommy Franks. The Labar family is a fourth generation Oklahoma family. That may not sound like a long time, but our grandfathers were born here, within the Comanche Nation, before the land runs. We are the proudest sponsor of the Tommy Franks Four Star Leadership Podcast. We hope listeners will heed the words of these distinguished men and women who have served our country at the highest levels and across all walks of life. When T.W. Shannon took the oath of office in January of 2013 at the age of 34, he made history by becoming the youngest speaker of the Oklahoma House of Representatives, as well as being the first Chickasaw and first African American to hold the post. In addition to breaking barriers in the reddest state in the Union, T.W.'s election as Speaker was also a nationally recognized feat, as he was the first African-American Republican in the country to head a legislative body since Reconstruction. Even before his ascension as the leader of the Oklahoma House, T.W. had a record of success as a history maker becoming the first Republican elected in the House District 64 seat in Southwest Oklahoma. Heralded as a rising star by the Republican National Committee, Speaker Shannon utilized his platform to champion common sense solutions that aim to advance minority communities alike in Oklahoma. T.W. was successful in Oklahoma's fight to repeal affirmative action. He also successfully led the effort to overhaul the state's welfare system by mandating a 20-hour work week for able-bodied adult recipients. Additionally, T.W. passed into law legislation which made Oklahoma the first state in the nation to provide a $5,000 tax deduction for parents of foster children. Before serving in the legislature, T.W. worked as one of the five C-level officers in the role of Chief Administrative Officer at the Chickasaw Nation, which boasted annual revenue of over $1 billion and employed over 7,500 employees. 
In his role with the Chickasaw Nation, he led the support functions for the most financially successful tribe in the country and worked on governmental affairs on both a state and national level. Additionally, T.W. has been an entrepreneur in his own public relations consulting operation for over a decade and currently leads the investment banking division of Premier Consulting in Tulsa, Oklahoma. As managing director, T.W. works with community banks across the country in developing a capital strategy and providing investment capital in the form of subordinated debt. He has been featured on numerous national forums discussing race in America, including the Situation Room with Wolf Blitz, Fox and Friends, Hannity, and Stuart Varney. His accomplishments are many, so let's go to our discussion with T.W. now and talk about what drives him. Good afternoon, T.W. Shannon. Thank you so much for being with us on our Four Star Leadership Podcast. Welcome to our program. Well, good afternoon. It is such an honor and a privilege. Thank you for having me as a Southwest Oklahoma uh, boy myself, you know, sharing that commonality with the general. This is the privilege of a lifetime. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. I would like to start. We, we've reviewed your bio and uh, all the great accomplishments and um, things that you have done up to this point. And I would like to start out asking you about your childhood. You are a 1978 model and born in Cotton, Oklahoma. Can you tell us about your childhood? Do you have any siblings um, about your parents? And just kind of start us out there. You bet. Well, growing up in Lawton, I will tell you, uh, I had the two parents that every kid deserved. Both my parents are from Oklahoma. I'm actually a sixth generation Oklahoman. Uh, my dad's family is from the Ardmore area and mom's family is from Muskogee. And uh, my father was a, was a history teacher and coach. And uh, my mom was a social worker. She retired from DHS after 30 years of service. And I have one sister uh, and she works on Fort Seal. Actually, she is the uh, domestic abuse coordinator for all of Fort Seal. So I, I say she, she's one of those people, she's one of those heroes that, that doesn't wear a cape every day. But growing up in Lawton, I always tell people I had the parents that every kid should have. They always made me believe that I was the most important thing in their life. I always knew I was a priority. But even even in addition to the accountability that they held me to, uh, I had a wonderful church family, Bethlehem Baptist Church in Lawton, a predominantly African-American church, about 200, 250 a Sunday. Um, I always knew that there were people in that church who had an expectation for me. Uh, when I was growing up, when you, when you grew up with the gift of gab like I did in a predominantly African-American church, one of the things that happens is, uh, you know, it's not uncommon on a Sunday for some older person, uh, usually a little old lady, to walk up to you and say, now, you know you're going to be a preacher one day. <laughs> and as a kid, uh, that used to bother me to no end because I didn't ever believe I was called to be a preacher and didn't think I wanted to be one, and I'm not. Uh, but later on, as I became an adult, I realized what a privilege that was because really what the community, what my church was saying to me was, we expect something from you. We have an expectation. And even to this day, I don't want to let them down. And so, um, you know, that, that church it means so much to me and the families in that church. And uh, they, they meant so much. But it gave me an amazing foundation uh, to earn my uh, bachelor's degree from Cameron University in southwest Oklahoma. And then I got my law degree from um, Oklahoma City University in 2004. And while I was going to law school, I actually worked for two members of Congress, for Congressman Tom Cole, who's the current congressman for the 4th District, and also uh, J.C. Watts, who preceded him. And my wife and I met at Cameron University, and we've been married 20 years. We have a 16-year-old and a 13-year-old. As a young person, you had this wonderful support system from your church. And I understand that because I had German immigrant grandparents and, and they would always say, we're expecting great things from you. And you always felt like, oh, Absolutely. I can never do anything to disappoint them. You know, I, I, I can't get into trouble. I can't sure. do anything wrong because, you know, disappointing them would be th the most horrible thing to happen. So can you tell me what was your turning point? What was your influence or turning point that directed you to the path of 
obviously politics because you um, got your BA and then your Juris Doctorate in law, and then you became a field rep for two Oklahoma, really great Oklahoma politicians. What, what influenced you to go that direction? You know, it, it's funny. We, we talk, I know we're here to talk about leadership today, and, and I think a big part of leadership is expectations, right? Because if you're a leader, uh, that means that there are people who expect things from you. They expect accountability. They expect honesty. They expect vision. Uh, and they expect direction. They don't expect perfection. Uh, but also, as a leader, you have expectations of things that you expect from people. You expect accountability. You expect uh, followership, uh, which is a big part of leadership. So um, I, I think when you ask the question, you know, what was kind of a turning point for me in my direction, of, of what I wanted to, whether it was law or business or, or, you know, serving as the CEO of a bank, it was certainly having great mentors. I mean, uh, my first job in politics was working for, as, as you mentioned, a guy named J.C. Watts, uh, who was the fourth ranking member of Congress and just maybe one of the most moral, um, ethical people I've ever met in my life. And uh, having worked for him, I learned so much about um, public office. I learned about public service. And I also learned about, you know, how, how you could have an influ influence on the macro level. You know, my parents, who were public servants, too, as a teacher and a social worker, you know, they taught a lot. They, they taught me a lot in the importance of public service, maybe on a micro level, on how you serve people one-on-one. -on -one. That was my church was, was so much about one-on-one. -on -one. But J.C. Watts gave me the real exposure of how public policy – uh, could impact people on a macro level. Um, how you, you know, if you if you are able to articulate a message and if you're able to get buy-in from people around you, um, you know, public service is a great way to do that, and public office certainly was. And because leadership for me, the way I define leadership has always been getting people to do what you want them to do because they want to do it. And it's that because they want to do it piece that is so important. And that requires a couple of things. That requires either you to set a vision and make people buy in and see that vision or getting people to trust you to move forward, even when they don't see the vision. Uh, that's really what leadership is. And I got to see that with some pretty amazing mentors like JC Watts and, and, and Tom Cole. Well, thank you. I think uh, that takes us into uh, a subject that I would like to talk about in our curriculum. But so what I'm hearing you say is that your parents who were public um, teachers and um, working in in the state government. Social worker. Yes, social worker. Yes, thank you. Um, taught you the value and, and shared a value in being a public servant, plus your church members lifting you up and saying, you know, we're expecting great things from you. And so you just, it was just an automatic, natural inclination to go into public service and be um, field representatives for J.C. Watts and um, Tom Cole. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And so what I, what I want... Uh, you were saying set a vision and trust uh, four of the, the four principles of leadership for our leadership program are caring, communication, common vision, and character. Caring being that you're about the people that you lead so that they trust you. And trust is a big part of our character. If we show people every day that we are trustworthy and that we're the same person all day, every day, whether we're um, at the lake on the weekends or um, in church on Sunday or at the ball field on Friday night, that we hold to the same values no matter where we are and who we're with. I think that is a huge part of trust and having those around us to uh, to trust you and, and respect your leadership. So um, we've already covered two of our really important um core curriculum of uh, leadership and also common vision, which you, we set a vision uh, that becomes a very powerful movement. If everybody is, um, believes in your mission, it's so important. And that leads me to um, something that I uh, 
that I think about you, one of the new programs that we have initiated called UCU, Understanding Community Understanding. And it's basically encouraging our young leaders, our juniors in high school to look around community or school and recognize issues that need to be improved. And how would they go about improving um, in their community or school. Did you start in high school, maybe um, looking for things that need to be improved because you have a long history of um, really looking for initiatives and recognizing initiatives. And how did you start out um, with, those, with those types of initiatives? You bet. So, you know, growing up, in, in Lawton as a kid, even in high school, I mentioned that, you know, there was an accountability factor for me. Not only did I have parents that held me accountable, but I had a community. I had a, a you know, a church full of people who, who loved their, their, their God. They loved their country. They loved their families. Um, and, and they, and they did that. And they, and they, and part of that community that they loved was me. And they, they told me they had an expectation. And so what, what that what that really did for me was I was reminded of, of what we believe in our Christian faith, that to whom much is given, much is required. And when you're born with a great family and a great community, and you're born into the greatest country that the world's ever seen, um, you do have a responsibility to give back. And, and so, yes, that was a part of my early, uh, again, having two parents that kind of served in the public sphere, it was just kind of part of our DNA. And so, you know, a lot of my, my, my efforts as a young person, I was involved in a, in a, in a, in a group that was a, um, a fraternity uh, type group that, that focused a lot on public service, Zenos and Kudos. Um, it was a predominantly um, African-American group that really taught and, and focused on leadership through community service. And so we were always um, on weekends, um, um, you know, assisting with community initiatives, we were we were exploring colleges and universities on spring break. Um, I just I always took to heart that I had been so blessed, and I and I knew with that came a sense of responsibility. And you talked about, you know, one of your core tenets of leadership is trust. And really, the only way to to, to earn trust is through consistency and time. Uh, it takes time and being consistent. And it doesn't mean being perfect. I think for young people, a lot of times there's a there's a sense, you know, well, you know, part of my career path is I've, I've had leadership responsibilities at an early age, and 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 part of that responsibility is is getting over the the, the need or the the inclination, the the temptation to try to present a perfect front. Um, leaders don't have to be perfect because none are. Uh, frankly, uh, leaders just have to be consistent and, and to be transparent, because I think now more than ever, young people are leaning and focusing and, and yearning for authenticity. You know, there's so much disingenuous, disingen disingenuity. Is that a word? Disingenuous? Yes, it is. What would be the word? Is it this? Well, either one. Uh, there, there's so much uh, uh, in, in the world now. That is not that is not genuine. Um, that you know, from social media to images that young people are bombarded with on television um, and magazines, you know, they're bombarded with things that are fake and that are false. That I think there is a real yearning and a real, um, uh, you know, and a real deep-seated need for authenticity. And so I think leaders have to be also authentic and in, into who they are. And understanding that their gifts and talents are enough, um, that they've been equipped through their own life experiences with enough to, to get a task done if they'll just lean into that authenticity. I think that's an important part of trust, frankly. I agree. And that brings me to another subject that I have really been looking into is mental toughness. And I think that you mentioned um, social pressure to be perfect and to lean into being more authentic and being yourself and being a real person more than resisting the um, the pressure to be something that you're not. And can you describe to me what, and, and I don't think there's any kind of a right or wrong answer, not that uh, 
I, I would just like your thoughts on mental toughness. I know for our young people, sometimes in our program, they say, gosh, this is so tough. You know, this is just so tough. And I think, you know, as a young leader, it's going to be tough. And, and I can't make it easier for you. We just have to learn how to be mental, mentally tough and, and get through it. She, could you share with me your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, part of it is, it, you know, part of success, it, it really, you know, you talk about victory. I don't care who it is. A winner is just a person who, when it got tough, they they, they decided to keep going, right? That, that That is the difference between a winner and someone who's failed. The winner, they they felt like giving up. Um, there they were moments where, where they, they, they thought they might quit, where they might turn around, uh, but they decided to press forward anyway. Uh, that's really what winning is. And, and part of the ability to do that, frankly, and this goes back to the, the, to the genuineness, um, it, it's really getting to know and understand you and your strengths and your capabilities and your weaknesses. Uh, as a leader, you do not and you will not have all the answers and you're not expected to. Uh, and don't, don't fall into the trap of allowing anybody to make you think you do, because I, I really think the hardest thing, whatever, whatever the, the whatever business you're in, whether it's a, you're a student or you're a parent or you're a, a, a politician or an attorney or a business person, um, it doesn't matter. The hardest thing to do is to look in the mirror and actually see what's there. We often tend to see what we want to see, and not what's actually there. And what's actually there. Is a human being, and being a human means that you have strengths, yes, but you also have weaknesses and shortcomings. There are things that take more effort for you than other people. Not everybody can be a Michael Jordan. Uh, very few can, as a matter of fact. In fact, you could argue no one is ever Michael Jordan, but you can be the best you, and it really is enough, but you have to know what that is. It's not just what the, the you that you hope to be. Um, or the you that you would like to be, but it's the you that you actually are. You have to know what that is, and and that and that will help you to hire for your against your weaknesses where you have weaknesses. If you're a person who doesn't who's not very organized, that helps you lean into that. But you have to first be authentic enough and genuine enough to to recognize what's actually in the mirror, uh, what's actually there, and uh, I think that's you know an important part of that leadership journey uh, for sure. And, and, and part of being mentally tough, mental, mental preparation, just girding your mind that you're going to push through to the finish line, no matter what you have to make up your mind before you get into the tough situations, because the, you know, the, the, the journey from the, the starting lineup to the finish line is filled with temptations to quit. It's filled with challenges. It's filled with, um, uh, you know, things that will potentially throw you um, off of your game. But ultimately, you have to make up in your mind before you get to the finish line, before you get to the starting line, you have to decide that you're going to see it all the way through. And I think that is really what being mentally prepared is. I agree. And I, when you take inventory, what you ask yourself, have I, have I prepared for this? Yes. Have I done all that I can do? Yes. I'm going to do my best. Yes. And, you know, so if you can check off all of those things, then I think that will truly help your mental toughness and just make sure that you take inventory and are prepared. Do you have any um, specific examples for um, and, and just kind of share your own personal experiences, specific examples. As far as mental toughness, can you share any personal stories of when you pressed on and maybe had doubts about whether or not it would work and it did? Or when you pressed on and maybe you, in, in hindsight, you think, well, I my very best and it, it just didn't work this time. Do you have any personal examples? You bet. Um, for sure on, you know, times where I had to lean in and, and press and continue forward, I think one of the amazing things about serving in, in, in political office or even running for office is 
there's an old saying that we all know there are people that hate us, but only people who run for office get an accurate count. Um, and so, you know, running for office, you, you get a pretty good sense of where you are. And, you know, I, when I first ran for office, I was 28 years old. Uh, I was the first Republican to hold my seat. It had always been co- controlled by Democrats. And so, and I, and I was young. I was, I was only 28 years old. And so there were a lot of people who thought, you know, as, as you often hear when there are young people with aspirations, hey, maybe one day you'll, you'll make a great, you know, representative or, or executive, whatever the job description is, you'll do great one day, but you should wait your turn. You should wait your time. Well, I, I really believe my time was right then. And so despite those efforts uh, by some who thought that, you know, I was maybe too too short in life experience, um, I continued to press forward and, and, I, and I received real um, affirmation when just a few years later, at the age of 33, my caucus elected me speaker designate um, to serve the state of Oklahoma. And I became the youngest speaker of the house at the time. That was for sure a time where um, I, I think, I, I, you know, having, you know, the mental preparedness, the, the, the mental um, uh, fortitude to keep pressing really came through. To the second part of your question, you know, can I think of a time where, um, where I, you know, I felt like I had done all I could do, but I still didn't get the outcome that I thought I wanted. I also ran for statewide office in 2014 and came up short. I ran for United States Senate, and I didn't get enough votes to make the uh, to, to make the election and become the United States Senator. Uh, but I learned then that you know you, you do a survey. I, I ran a a clean race. I ran a I ran a respectable race, and I did it using the um, uh, frankly the the values that I learned from my parents and from my from my from my uh, church family. And, and, and leaned in on my faith, and, and I felt like I was very proud of the race that we ran. And even though we had done all of the right things, it wasn't meant to be. And uh, what I learned after that was that, you know, losing the election is not the end of the world. I, I don't recommend it. Uh, but, but ultimately, I knew I had done what, what I thought was my best, and, I, and it was a moment to be proud. And, and after that, there were a lot of opportunities for me. I shortly became a bank CEO after that that adventure and I, and and I think having gone through that process really prepared me for a lot of the um, opportunities that I see serving as a as a CEO of a bank and uh certainly you know using my experience uh and and, and time in public office I I appreciate and we all do appreciate the human interest stories where we know that not everyone is perfect and that we do not need to hold ourselves to that level of perfection because it it's just it just doesn't happen and so it it doesn't always happen i guess is what i want to say that it's okay and um i would like for you to share since that time that you lost that race then then what did you do do you to take inventory now do I want to what do I want to do or did you already have something a, a plan B in place um I, I didn't have a plan B per se but but I you know I had met guys before that allowed their position to define their identity and and I learned very on my parents taught me that you never allow what you do to define who you are um yes I had an amazing opportunity to serve the state as a state representative and then a speaker of the house. And, um, but I never allowed my first name to be representative or speaker or any of that. You know, when I looked in the mirror, I, I never saw a speaker of the house or a CEO, bank CEO or, or a future United States Senator. I, I don't see any of that. What I, what I do see when I look in the mirror, I see a father. I see a dad, I see a husband, um, I see a brother, I, I see a, a, a community, um, uh, you know, a leader, a community member. And, and those are the values that I take uh, with me uh, in every situation. Uh, and, I, and I try to uh, re- remember that to whom much is given, much is required. And uh, I just try to, to authentically be the best me that I can be because ultimately, that's all we got anyway. All we have really to offer is our story. And uh, my story is unique. 
But what's not unique is everyone has a story and it is their own. And that is part of what makes them uh, who they are, those life experiences, not, not some title. So am I right in saying that you, you advocate keeping your eye on the ball and the right doors, the doors that are supposed to open will open? Absolutely. Um, I, I have found early on that, you know, I don't believe in coincidences. I do believe in faith um, and I do believe in predestination, but I also believe that we've got to do our part and do our own uh, work. And, and I, and I believe that, you know, when you, when you commit to hard work, that lo a lot of good things follow, um, even if you can't see them right away, if, if you have a work ethic and you're willing to work hard, um, my, my, my experience is, and my testimony is this country is still pretty amazing and still works. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate the positive thoughts about where we are. Can you tell me about your, how you decided to start your own public relations and consulting operation? Well, I had one, I had, before I ran for the legislature, I was working for my tribe as a chief administrative officer. And then when I moved back to run for office, I had gained some really valuable experience. I was 25 years old and I had been a C-level officer for a company that was more than a billion dollars in assets and over 7,500 employees. That gave me a real sphere of influence uh, and a real baseline of knowledge about multiple industries because we were involved in so many. So um, I, I'm sorry, what was the question? Repeat the question, I got lost. Oh no, that's okay. My question was, um, how did you decide to uh, start your own public relations and consulting operation then at that point in your life? I think you said you were 25. And I think we kind right. of inventory, as you said, take inventory of yourself and be realistic. So was that part of your decision to start your own public relations and consulting operation? Uh, you, you bet it was. Having gained those amazing experiences and, and needing the flexibility in my schedule, that's what gave me the, the umption uh, the gumption, rather, to to begin my own PR business, working with my wife, and we service clients uh, from across the state and the country, rather, uh, helping them, you know, with branding and also with with matters of of uh, uh, public interest. And you know, I think it's great um, taking inventory of yourself and having some really great mentors that help us identify what those really great assets are that we have. And I don't know if you had that or you just kind of uh, realized, you know, hey, I've gained some really great experience in these particular areas that I can offer to, to the public and, and offer that as a service. I think that it's great that we can take inventory of our own assets, but also to have great mentors who help us identify those assets. And then when you take that inventory, you realize I have something really great and a value to offer my community. And you decided to start your own public relations consulting firm then. Was was it mentors or was it just your own idea or combination? Um, I, I, well, I've always had great mentors. So I, I've had four. Russell Perry, who was the largest minority uh, to own uh, family uh, radio stations around the country. The, the largest private, Perry Publishing Broadcasting, is the largest privately held radio conglomerate in the country. Uh, Mr. Perry uh, owned a station in Lawton when I was in when I was an undergraduate, and I worked for him, and he became a mentor. Uh, I mentioned one already: J.C. Watts, former congressman of the fourth district, and Tom Cole, the current congressman of the fourth district. And then I also uh, consider um, Governor Bill Anatubby of the Chickasaw Nation as a mentor as well, and I certainly. Uh, consulted with them along the way about different decisions, but it was really about taking an inventory about what talents do I have? What, 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 where can I be added value? 
uh, what are what are my giftings and what are my weaknesses? And what I knew was is that I understood relationships and I understood messaging, and uh, that's where I where I made my decision to to start uh, a public relations consulting uh, company because I knew that we could add value to customers because of the strengths and talents that I had. You know, but I also knew my weaknesses. I knew that I you know I'm not the most organized person in the world. It's something I have to work toward. Um, and I have to, you know, be conscientious about deadlines. Um, and, and sometimes my, my creativity, I have to have space in order to create. And because I believe people are born on a spectrum when it comes to their gifting, either they're born geared more toward the, the creative side or they're geared more toward the orderly side. And I think for every person finding that balance is different, but knowing where you are, um, I think in, in that, you know, on that spectrum really helps to kind of guide people into kind of where they should be spending a lot of their time expecting work, you know, things that come, you know, the, the goal in life is to have a, a, a job, a career that you love because all of a sudden it doesn't feel like work when you're doing what you love. Hello, this is Jay Zacharias with the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute and Museum, and I would like to tell you about one of our partner sponsors. His name is Justin Krieger, and he has worked as an independent insurance agent at Krieger Insurance Agency in his hometown of Hobart, Oklahoma, since 1999. Justin is honored to help with the annual Celebration of Freedom event and has been a board member for the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute and Museum for many years. He is also a fifth generation farmer and rancher in Kiowa County, where cattle, crops, and even insurance is sold with a handshake. Give him a call at 580-726-3076 or come by the office if you would like to speak with Justin Krieger or Kathy Lankford about insurance. We are thankful to our customers and friends who have supported us through the years. Again, Justin would like to say how honored he is to live in such a great country and how proud he is to help sponsor these podcasts. Please enjoy the rest of this podcast experience from your friends at Krieger Insurance Agency. Absolutely. And, you know, that brings me to uh, General Franks, our favorite quote of his that we use for our leadership program daily is great leaders are developed, not just born. And, and he is a perfect model of that um, because he he gained his focus and career through the military. And that's not for everybody, but that's where he gained it. And he believes that all leaders are not just born to be leaders. They're just not born knowing uh, everything they need to know that leadership is a developmental process. That's what I believe you're describing to me is developing and taking that journey of, of where you can make a difference. For our young students today, what kind of guidance would you give them? And, and maybe keeping in consideration our four core principles of leadership, which are caring about the people that you're leading, common vision, everyone being on the same page and, and everyone believing in the mission, um, communication, being able to communicate with everyone. And, and I think that's probably an important part of your uh, public relations um, business to do. And then also character. But what would you share with our young students today? What would, what would you say to them as far as their career path and, and encourage them them to stay on the path? Well, I, I think a, a couple of things. The first thing is, as I mentioned before, it's so important to get an inventory of, of who you are and understand what your own gifting is and, and what comes to you naturally. Because more than likely, those things that come to you naturally are, are things you're going to enjoy and, and things that you can continue to further develop and hone those skills and you can add value and, and usually when you're adding value, um, earning a living will come uh, pretty quickly. But, 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 on, but on that same note, I would also say that the currency of life really is relationship. Um, and, and, you know, finding a way to maintain those relationships with your parents, your siblings, your, your, your grandparents, those, those teachers. Um, you know, I have teachers now, you know, who, 
who I'm running for public office now. And I have teachers now who my, my, my ninth grade algebra teacher, uh, Lou Truex, uh, he, he was texting me the other day, giving me some advice and, and asking questions. I mean, I, I, I do think that even for the most, and particularly for ambitious young people um, who've been called into leadership roles, I think it's so important to not dismiss the value of relationship uh, because it, it matters. It, it, it may be the most important thing in, in life that we have, um, our, our ability to build and maintain relationships. And so I would just say to them, you know, yes, hone in on what your craft is and what you're really good at and, and, and never be afraid. Don't, that doesn't mean lock yourself into it that you can't expand beyond that, but no, what you do well and, and, and lean into that and, and continue to expand and explore other things because you can always learn that you're good at something else. But also don't dismiss the value of, of relationships because ultimately they matter. And, and, and whatever business you're in, if, if you make the mistake of thinking you're just in the, you know, you're in just in the widget making business or, you, you, the truth is you're not, you're in the people business. And, you know, General Frank, you know, I, you think about, you know, him and for whom this podcast is named and, and you know, who, who's an American hero. You know, I just got to believe that his ability to main, re, maintain relationships with, with colleagues and, and with subordinates. Uh, General Frank's beliefs that, uh, great leaders are developed, not born, and he is a great example to that. I just wanted you to um, share with us, is there anything else that you want to share with our students? No, other than, you know, never take for granted how wonderful a place America is. I mean, if you ever doubt how terrific this place is, just look around at our competitors. Um, there's a reason that we immigrate over 1 million people a year legally into this country. Uh, people spend their life savings, saved for decades, trying to get here. Uh, there is a reason that, that you know, frankly, uh, we saw people just a few months ago in Afghanistan hugging on to wings of airplanes to get here. There's a reason we saw a mother on the same which is in Afghanistan, you know, handing her newborn child to a soldier with an M16 on his on his on his uh, hip, not knowing him, not knowing his language, not knowing anything about him, other than that he had the old red, white, and blue on his sleeve. Uh, that tells me that the place that this place that we call home and the rest of the world calls America is still a pretty good place. It's still a pretty amazing place. And uh, if you just if you ever doubt it, just look at our our, our enemies. Uh, those that are our competitors like China and Russia, uh, they don't have immigration problems. They don't have people trying to get in there. And, and that tells me that this is still a pretty special place. And uh, young people should take inventory of that uh, and remember, and don't let anybody tell you differently, America is still the good guy. It doesn't mean that we're a perfect nation, but we're the only nation that's ever tried to be. And uh, I think that's an important message that you know, young people need to hear over and over again. And my life story is frankly a testament to that. You know, I grew up in Lawton, and the things that I was able to accomplish in this in this country, in this state, that doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. Uh, and and that that is just a reminder of how truly special America is, and and how truly special Oklahoma is. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate all your words and thoughts and, and the message that you share with our young people. And I know that they will gain dearly from it. And we wish you the very best in all that you do and appreciate you taking time to be with us today. Thank you again to REI Oklahoma for making this podcast possible. For nearly 40 years, the board, staff, patrons, and supporters of the nonprofit economic development REI Oklahoma are committed to expanding Oklahoma's economic prosperity, earning the reputation of being one of the most comprehensive economic development organizations in the country. 
business loans, training workshops, business consulting, and networking opportunities, as well as technical assistance and even commercial business space are made available to Oklahoma entrepreneurs and small businesses. For low and moderate income individuals and families, down payment and or closing cost assistance is offered. Learn more at reiok.org. This has been the Four Star Leadership Podcast. Now it's your turn, Four Star listeners. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and let us know what you thought of this episode. Be sure to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and tune in next month for our next episode that airs every last Friday each month. Go be great. The Labar family is a fourth-generation Oklahoma family. That may not sound like a long time, but our grandfathers were born here, within the Comanche Nation, before the land runs. We are the proudest sponsor of the Tommy Franks Four Star Leadership Podcast. We hope listeners will heed the words of these distinguished men and women who have served our country at the highest levels and across all walks of life.